How about this for a TV movie? A leading man, larger than life, tries to build a dream car. He loses millions of dollars in the process. He gets tangled up with the IRA, with the Colombians, with drugs. But here's the best bit. He gets the British government to bankroll everything. The FBI set him up. He's on every front page in the world, but he walks away scot-free. It's a hell of a plot. I've even got a title. The DeLorean Story. John Zachary DeLorean was born in Detroit in 1925. He abandoned early plans to be a musician, graduating instead to the auto business, where he quickly emerged as a major player, soaring through the ranks at General Motors. And it was at GM's Pontiac division that DeLorean first made his mark with the legendary GTO. And the formula was simple. Take a boring mid-sized car like the Pontiac Tempest, drop in a huge V8 the size of Arkansas and stand back. The result turned Pontiac from maker of grandmother's gadabouts to some of the hottest cars on the street. DeLorean had a big success on his hands. He'd become an auto industry celebrity, a glamorous wife on his arm and a string of Hollywood chums. But by 73, it was too much for the establishment on the top floor of GM's HQ. He may have been vice president of car and truck, but he was seen as a maverick who liked to top up his salary by wheeling and dealing on company time. With too many fingers in too many pies, they had to let him go. But the man had a plan. DeLorean knew that Americans were sick to the back teeth of Detroit's cynicism. They'd buy a brand new car, drive it out of the showroom, only to find their tails being chased by next year's model. It was planned in obsolescence. So he promised an ethical sports car. A car that wouldn't be replaced every year, that didn't rust away to nothing in no time at all, and paid more than just lip service to consumer safety. John DeLorean was going to take the US auto industry and turn it upside down. DeLorean's original design was indeed ambitious, with stainless steel panels, gullwing doors and cutting edge safety features like airbags and a crash-resistant plastic understructure. Italian designer Giorgetto Giugiaro wrapped it all up in a futuristic body shape. And by 77, the first running prototype was finished. DeLorean immediately used it to garner interest from prospective dealers and customers, who promptly went crazy. I was fortunate enough to have this car on my showroom floor for a few days, the prototype. The number of people we could attract who said, can I leave a deposit for the car? And we said, no, we're not taking any more deposits. It got to such a point that I said, the only way we'll take a deposit is 5,000 cash and don't bug me. <laughs> He also needed a factory to build it. After rejecting sites across the US, DeLorean was tantalizingly close to signing a deal with Puerto Rico. Then, at the last minute, the Irish Development Agency made him a better offer, and Johnny was off to Limerick. But the Irish had the good sense to conduct a feasibility study and backed off fast. DeLorean then goes into a sulk and tells everybody he's going to do the deal with the Puerto Rican government. Until that is, he hears of some rather attractive terms being offered by the Northern Ireland Development Agency. They say they're going to give him £55 million up front in return for an investment from him of just £546,000. The deal works like this. For every £100 the British taxpayer chucks in, all DeLorean has to find is just one pound. The man does it again. By the end of 78, the factory was well underway on a greenfield site between Catholic and Protestant housing estates in Dunmurray, Belfast. But the promised car was still nowhere near production ready. Which is why DeLorean came here, to the Lotus factory in Norfolk. He wanted Lotus's boss, Colin Chapman, to productionize the DeLorean. Now, Chapman was none too keen, especially when he knew that it had to be done in less than two years. But Lotus wanted the consultancy work and also wanted the money. And DeLorean was offering a contract worth nearly 10 million pounds.
When Lotus engineers took delivery of the prototype, they didn't exactly jump up and down. The body was as stiff as jelly and it handled like a duck on an ice rink. Chapman pressed for a mid-engined layout, but DeLorean wanted to woo the swinging bachelor with room behind the seats for a set of golf clubs. DeLorean wouldn't budge and the engine was banished to the back. And that's not all. DeLorean had boasted endlessly about the car's ability to withstand crashes and key to that was a new form of technology called ERM, Elastic Reservoir Moulding. He wanted the whole underside made out of this, but Lotus took one look at it and said this will not work and binned it, reverting instead to resin technology and a conventional chassis. So all those much vaunted promises that DeLorean had made about the car being technically audacious, gradually, one by one, they were disappearing into the ether. To fix the floppy body, Chapman's team simply grafted on the steel backbone from their own Esprit. As time went on, the car's design owed less and less to DeLorean and more and more to Lotus. John DeLorean's dream was very much based on, on this premise of providing a, a, a safer motor car, a more fuel efficient motor car, uh, something that would almost last forever, very competitive in the marketplace. Um, the reality, unfortunately, because of the limitations on, on the, the powertrain and the configuration and so on, uh, was very different and we never uh, ever achieved the dream. But Johnny wasn't worried. He was more interested in managing money. The company that ran the Belfast factory was based in New York and he owned 84% of it. The British government may have co-owned Dunmurray, but they couldn't touch him in the States where he paid himself a whopping half a million bucks a year. He had a, a, a very much of a jet-setting lifestyle. He had apartments in New York. He had several ranches at the time. He had a very expensive way of running his end of the business. Back in Belfast, the factory was ready, but the car wasn't. In a panic stab at durability testing, cars were driven round the clock until bits broke or fell off. DeLorean knew it took five years to get a car into production, yet he was pushing for two. Despite the best efforts of the workforce, it was a deadline that inevitably brought a blizzard of problems. The car was brought into production sooner, in my opinion, than it should have been, with insufficient time to, to really develop the production problems out. So there were quite a few problems involved with the actual build quality of the cars. The result of that was that, I couldn't tell you how many, but the first several hundred were completely stripped and rebuilt in America before they went to the customer. In March 81, just three months after production started, the DMC-12 was launched at the Geneva Motor Show. The expectations for any vehicle that would really wow the public, um, it would have to be something very special, and this vehicle clearly was not that. Uh, the motoring press were generally nonplussed by the car. It was underpowered, it was an old design. Jajaro had actually penned the thing uh, five or six years earlier and it hadn't changed or been updated very much. Really wasn't a sterling piece at all. And if the motor moguls over there in downtown Detroit had been worried about John DeLorean's brave new car, they needn't have, because it was a sham. He'd promised airbags, he'd promised a plastic monocoque, he'd promised it would be cutting edge. It wasn't. GM would have made this car better. The doors, the much vaunted gullwing doors, never ever worked. The struts were too weak, it never went all the way up. And because they were so complicated, the window wouldn't go down completely, so you had this letterbox slot in the door, making the interior feel like solitary confinement in Alcatraz. The engine, it wasn't DeLorean's own, it was a warmed over Renault 2.8 litre V6 out of the Renault 30. It produced in American spec a piffling, an inconsequential 130 brake horsepower. We're not talking quality here. Far from it. So apart from the futuristic stainless steel shell, underneath it was all very orthodox, very mediocre, and really rather dull. A bit like the driving experience. It 
really does feel like a tomb in here. It's dark, it's oppressive, it's claustrophobic. And a very plasticky tomb at that. Look at this window switch. There's no headroom. Anybody over six foot and you've got to wear a cushion on your head because you're, you're constantly hitting the roof. Lotus might have sorted out the handling for the European versions, but for the American ones, they had to put squishy boulevard springs on them. But worst of all, it was supposed to cost just 12,000 bucks, which would have been great. But by the time it hit showroom carpets, it was listing at over 26 grand, putting it up against some very serious and capable opposition. Which would have been fine if the thing had been competitive, but it wasn't. Compared to Titans like the Mercedes SL and the Porsche 911, it was hopeless. By the time the federal spec emission piper was bolted on to the feeble Renault engine, it had all the performance of a rampaging glacier. You could throw a cat through the panel gaps and the interior just crumbled to the touch. It was perfume on a pig. But for a while, nobody noticed that the emperor was in the buff. The brouhaha fueled an initial burst in sales and premiums were being paid. For the first six months, it even outsold Porsche. DeLorean was predicting sales of 10,000 a year. Oh, it was very, very exciting. And of course, we always had mobs of people that were uh, crowding around it. Uh, we had several invitations to take the car to car shows because nobody had ever seen it. So it was really a showstopper. Live the dream. Drive the DeLorean today. But it wasn't long before the public saw through the stainless steel charade. With the engine in the back, there was indeed room for a set of golf clubs. But other more important design details had escaped DeLorean's attention. The burnished steel showed up fingerprints like a mirror. And worse, the standard Renault alternator was too weak to cope with the demands of the electronics and air conditioning, flattening the battery in days. So if you popped the electronic locks from the inside, you could literally lock yourself in until someone came to prize you out. Mr. DeLorean was in fact trapped in the car on one occasion. Um, as these things happen, it couldn't help to a nice chap. Uh, the, uh, the door locks failed at the critical time. He was at a reception in London and he just couldn't get out. But uh, it was sorted in due course, but uh, it certainly got things going at the factory. Sadly, it was too late. At the end of its first year, only 4,500 cars had found owners. But DeLorean needed more money and planned to float shares in his American parent firm. He needed his company to look busy and successful, so he actually stepped up production, putting raw recruits straight onto the line. Belfast was making cars no one wanted and hemorrhaging a fortune. Endlessly optimistic, DeLorean went to London to ask for yet more cash. But there'd been a seismic shift in the political landscape. Subsidies were out of fashion, and the iron hairdo was not for turning. It's a crime. DeLorean's luck finally ran out when he was accused of brokering a multi-million dollar cocaine deal. Between this and the other, it'll generate uh, about four and a half, uh, not less than four and a half mil. The feds had filmed the whole thing. DeLorean was going down. Or he would have been if the judge hadn't accused the FBI of entrapment. DeLorean was acquitted, but even he had to admit that his reputation was in tatters. I don't know, would you buy a used car from me? <laughs> but the joke came as cold comfort for the 2,600 workers in Belfast. The factory was closed and the cars and equipment auctioned off for whatever they'd fetch. The feeling on the line during the last days of DeLorean was almost of desperation. There was a lot of resignation. I felt terribly sorry for everybody on the track there. They'd worked their guts out for the company. They'd come into the company knowing that it was the first job they'd had for years and years. They wondered why so many staff were being taken on and not being trained in the proper manner. And they became sort of resigned to the thought that they would earn as much money as they could while it lasted. So it was a terrible thing. 
really depressing. So exactly how much money went into the project and where did it go? Well, the absurdity is, to this day, nobody is exactly sure. All we know is that the British government gambled £85 million. US investors bet another £8 million, and US dealers threw in three and a half. But when DeLorean was busted by the FBI, all that was left was a mere couple of hundred grand. It's a gas. In 1984, a British government report concluded that over $17 million had disappeared without trace, and it was one of the worst abuses of taxpayers' money ever. But there are still those who insist that John DeLorean was a mere victim of circumstance, or worse. I understand that there are still a body of people, probably most of them owners of DeLorean automobiles, who think that it was a visionary car, who think that there was a conspiracy to stop it, who think that th there were darker forces that force this brilliant man out of business and to them I simply say nonsense. You know, there are probably a handful of people somewhere who still think the world is flat. Given all the obstacles, it's a miracle that the DMC was ever built at all and that helps the mystique. Maybe that's why a man with a Ferrari and a Maserati has found space for one in his collection. You've got to be a certain amount of an extrovert and a little bit egotistical when you drive one of these because without doubt Everybody sort of has. You can't. You cannot be hidden in this. You know, it, wherever you go, someone's going to be saying, "Hello, what the hell's that? Is it a Lotus? Is it a Lamborghini? What the heck is it?" And then, of course, you can see them say, "It's a DeLorean," and I think that's the excitement of it. It is just so rare. To be quite honest, if I had to, for financial reasons, sell one of the three, the DeLorean would be the one to go. Although, of course, it wouldn't raise anything like the money of the other two. But it will always be a very well-recognised piece of motoring history, I think, for many years to come. No doubt much aided by the uh, Back to the Future films. The Back to the Future trilogy did indeed immortalise the car that John built. I'm going to take a little joyride. It would have been the greatest plug in auto history. I'll stop a bye-bye. But it was all too late in the day. Universal Studios even opened a Back to the Future ride in Florida with, yep, you guessed it, 24 DeLorean replicas. Let's hope they're better made than the originals. The spectre of his ill-fated enterprise continues to haunt John DeLorean. He's just filed for bankruptcy and there's still a warrant out for his arrest in the UK. You'd think it was time for Johnny to quit the car business. Well, you'd be wrong. At this point in time, I'm doing a new project. I've got the financing in place to do another car project. And I'm doing it in a different way. I'm only, the only thing I've asked is I don't want any profit from it. I want it all to go to certain charities. But in the meantime, I'm insisting that people who invested in, with me and believe in me are going to be repaid two for one on their investment. Well, 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 well. Looks like we haven't heard the last of Mr. John Zachary DeLoria. You have to admit, it is an incredible story. It would make a fantastic TV movie. There's just one tiny problem. Nobody would ever believe it. No more heroes anymore.